All right. So to continue where we left off, we were finishing up our first segment with conditional logic and if-else. <clears throat> our next half, uh, we're going to be starting into a little bit more advanced stuff. Data driving tests, data driving sources, how we set those up, how we do inputs, how we do verifications, how we do data driven element logic, which is just so cool. And then we'll get into some extraction and passing variables, coding and code samples, test list scheduling, results. There's some new re results and reporting data that we get to look at from, uh, from our release that just came out a couple weeks ago. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then we've got uh, a lot to cover in the last hour with performance load and mobile. Again, if you've got a vote on, uh, you know, if you want more mobile or if you want more load, you know, please let me know. Uh, sometimes those seem to be um, either or, or if you want sort of the general uh, on both, I can do that as well. <clears throat> okay, so carrying on, we're going to start with data driving tests and. Uh, there's a lot of cool things we can do with data driving tests, and I'm, I'm going to jump into a wow loop scenario while we're at it too. So first of all, we're going to jump back. We're going to come back to this project. Uh, there's, again, some cool things we've already seen in this project with the master test and the subtest and the if-else login scenario, things like that. <clears throat> but I'm going to go back to my TFS project that we were previously on. And in that, we're going to open up a while loop so you can see how those look in addition to the if-else. Very much the same type of uh, <clears throat> idea. The reason you would use a while loop, a scenario for that, uh, one of the online catalog shopping stores came to me and they said, we, we have these dresses uh, for our women's clothing and they show up randomly. And we want to make sure that this particular dress is always there. You know, just pick one and but it makes sure it's there, but it may be on different pages. Uh, we just don't know which one it's going to be. So we had to create a test that could go as long as it needed to go until it found the appropriate address. And um, so that we used a while loop for that. A while loop that says, while we can, uh, well, really what I do a lot of times is, while I can't find something, and I'll show you uh, one of these examples here. This is a while loop grid search, and uh, this basically is the while loop part of it. It has the same capability. You, you, you drop it in from the conditions option. Uh, there's no two branches. There's only the one branch in this case. So while this condition is being met, then stay in this loop and, and repeat this action. Okay. So a lot of times, in this case, I did, while I don't see a particular item in a grid, go to the next page of a grid. Same thing we did with the dress in the shopping network was we said, well, while we don't see the purple dress, go to the next page or load the next set of dresses or continue scrolling or whatever it might have been until we see that dress and, and continue to reevaluate that until it shows up. Okay, So that's where you could use a while loop. Again, it's the same kind of concept. You grab a verification. I did wait for exist not, so I'm saying make uh, wait. While while it doesn't exist, go to the next page, reevaluate. While it doesn't exist, go to the next page, and then when it does exist, it comes out of the while loop and completes the the rest of the execution. So that's what a while loop looks like. Um, now data driving tests. So let's go back to our web test that we had started with. which was web test three here. And let's say we want to data drive this. A very common request is to data drive you know, login process. We might want to perform the same duties uh, as different users maybe for a particular scenario. So we'll log in as user one, we'll do that thing, and then we'll log in as user two, we'll do that same thing or vice versa. So if, to do that, we can create one nice little login process like we've got here, and then add data to it. Now, where does the data come from? Well, the data can come from local data, so that's one option. And you'll see some examples where I use that later. Uh, or it could come from outside data. 
As I mentioned earlier, you can bring in Excel, CSV, XML, or even live database files, whether it's an ODBC or OCDB or uh, OLEDB connected data source. You've got a lot of options there. And uh, basically, when you want to attach it to a test, you, you, know, you add it to the project, and then you just highlight the test in question, and you click Bind Test, and you select your data source. Now, I don't know if this data source is awake or not. I'm going to give it a shot. Either way, I'll show you something about it. This is a SQL database. Um, and the thing about a, a SQL database or a database in question is, uh, for a data source is that you can provide a query or you could pick a raw table. So uh, here it's come back and I could say use T-SQL and I could put together a query string that might be a join statement or order by or sort by or something like that to get my data together. Or I could just pick from a raw table and then filter it from there. Let me switch over to uh, one of these other ones, an Excel spreadsheet, and you know here we have a, a nice large data set here too. The beautiful thing, whether you're doing a uh, database or a spreadsheet or, or whatever, or whether you're doing a SQL query or, or what have you, you can then filter that data set further even at, at the column level. So first of all, we're talking about a data set that's a, that's a database that you attach to the to the project. I can use that data source across all of these tests. But then when I go to bind it to a specific test, I can get very specific about what data out of that source I want and how I want it organized. Between the query options and then the filter abilities that are here at the uh, column level, I mean, you can really get pretty fancy with uh, what data you might want. Okay? And then you click bind. And now that data is available to the test. And you'll see that data within our properties panel when we highlight a particular test step and we go to the bindings property and click on the ellipses here on the right. The dropdown should provide us with all of the uh, column names that we have available in that data source. Okay. Now, uh, this isn't the right data source for this particular test, so let me go back a step and rebind this. It's the right spreadsheet, but the wrong page, the wrong sheet. I want this one here, sheet three, and we'll bind that. And then back in here, so on the username step, I want to bind the username column. Well, username is here, we'll click set, and we now have a data-driven test step. And same thing for password. We can go to the password field if we have that available. Oh, there it is. And we could data drive password. Okay. So now we had an iterative test. I'm going to turn off annotations. We've seen this test run enough slowly. We're going to speed it up. But this time it will run multiple iterations. I'm going to go back to Safari here. Okay. So there's the first one. That succeeded, it looks like. The second one which is a bogus login. And you may want to do a verification that says, well, when I have a bogus login, did it say invalid username and password? Or even branch it into a password recovery scenario if there's a forgotten password. So you might do an if else in that scenario. And then here's our third iteration. And it should fail out there. Cool. So iteration one, seven out of seven. Green check marks all the way down. Iteration two, it failed on the final verification. Iteration three, same thing, failed on the final ver verification, meaning it didn't get logged in correctly. And of course, all the failure details and things that we saw previously are here for us again. Uh, and that was data related that it didn't uh, log in successfully, right? So, so there's data driving with a nice little spreadsheet, okay? Now that's data driving inputs. Now, I could also data drive verifications, uh, like this verification here, rather than uh, maybe for, for logout, and, and, and maybe a good example was that uh, Syfinity login test we saw previously, where it was looking at a particular name, Andy versus Andrew versus your account, right? Uh, I could data drive that verification. 
and this is the same process. You're just basically highlighting the step you want to data drive, and you're choosing a column name. So uh, maybe rather than verifying the logout shows up, I'll verify that the appropriate username shows up. That's another type of verification that I might data drive. And again, you just pick it, set it, you're good to go. Pretty easy to do, pretty easy to undo uh, to data drive. And it will naturally iterate through all the number of records that you provide. So if you've got 200 records, it'll run that test 200 times. Okay. Okay, so that's basics of data driving, the surface, what I call the surface level. And, and I do get this question a lot. I do want to make sure to clarify this. I get the question a lot of how do we verify what's in the database shows up on screen correctly. And we've just accomplished that. We basically attach the database to the project as a data source. We then bind the database source to the test in question. And then we have a, a verification that's verifying something on screen that we data drive. And effectively what we're doing is we're pulling on a value from the database to inject into this verification. In this particular case, if I was to, ver uh, to data drive this verification, it would basically say verify the text content contains and instead of logout, it would inject the username for iteration one, the first record, the username for iteration two on the second iteration, uh, and so forth. And so that's the data-driven verification, pulling a value from the database, verifying that it shows up correctly on screen. Uh, the reason we get that question asked a lot is because it's necessary in testing to, to check that your data is correct, uh, but it's also important to note that that's a codeless thing in Test Studio to be able to, to do that. And a lot of tools can't say that that's codeless to be able to grab a data value from a database and verify that it shows up on screen correctly. Now, going the other way, if we want to write back to the database or read from the database directly, that's where we would use a coded step. We'll look at some coded step examples uh, once we get there. So data-driven uh, inputs, data-driven verifications, pretty, pretty simple, right? And I mentioned at the beginning where you can data drive uh, URLs. Since we have a data source here, you'll see that the same column names show up. Obviously not a smart move to, to data drive the URLs. I actually have on that uh, spreadsheet here, uh, I believe a different sheet that I use for data driving dates, a different sheet for data driving URLs, different sheet for those username and passwords. I've even got a language sheet here. Let me show you what this one does. I, I'm not sure if I have that application at hand, but I'd like to show you what the test accomplishes. Actually, I have a, a couple of these, so we'll just do a more broad search for language testing. Data-driven find logic. So this is a super simple test. I love it. It's just, uh, it is great. Uh, it navigates to apple.com support site where you can choose the country uh, that you want to get your support in. and it waits three seconds and then it clicks on the country and then it verifies that the welcome message shows up. Okay, now this is a very simple test that you'll see if I execute it. We'll, we'll go ahead and turn on annotation to slow this down and we'll execute this one in uh, Firefox so you can see what it does. So we navigate to the Apple support site. All these countries and flags show up. We're waiting to make sure everything renders correctly, and then we're going to go find the United States, and then we're going to verify that it says welcome. And then something else happens, iteration two, where all of a sudden now we're going through the same process, but instead we're going to Germany and making sure it says willkommen. And in iteration three, we're going to France, and we're going to make sure it says bienvenue. It's simple, it's easy. You just saw the same test run in three different languages. How is that happening, right? Uh, if that's not reuse, and, and, and the, the ways in which you can extend this little stub of a test into many different ways and in, in arenas of, of language verification is just phenomenal. Now, there's surface level verification here. Verify contents of this welcome message, and I'm data driving that with some value. 
But that's not really the magic. The magic is happening under the hood at the element level. And actually, let me show you my data first, because in this case, I'm using local data. And local data is great for this kind of scenario. This is also a great test that I like to send people. And by using local data, I can send you a single TS test file that has the data, the steps, the elements, everything in it. And it's a tiny file. And you can plug it into your test studio and execute it. Um, so I like local data for those kinds of things, or for small data sets uh, where you're not needing something major. You might use local data. You can tell it how many columns you want. You can refresh this and update this. You can right-click and rename the columns so you get something that makes sense to you. But effectively, I've got United States, Deutschland, and France. I've got welcome, willkommen, and bienvenue. And that's it. Okay, so there's the data set. The magic of it is really here. So in the click United States span, if we open up this element, and we don't need a live connection for this, you'll see the magic. The magic is that when I recorded this, it captured it as the United States span, because I clicked on my country. And uh, I was able to see the way in which it was being identified it had different options. Well, I chose to identify my country by its text content, by the label. And by doing that, I was able to then swap that out. And you'll notice that it's using a contains operator. So basically we're saying navigate to the, t the Apple support site and find the span that contains the text content of insert country here, right? That's effectively what we're achieving. So at runtime, you get iteration one with the United States, and then uh, Deutschland, and then France for iterations two and three. Uh, so how do we do that? That is very simple. You capture the initial element. This might be representative of what that looks like. No, I've altered this one as well. Uh, as you can see, I've got a few dupes in there. But um, we could spin it up as well. But you capture the initial one. You go in to edit the element. In fact, we'll go ahead and right-click and do a run to here so we can show you that. Boom. I've got 20 minutes to burn through a couple other important uh, functions here before we get into our last hour of mobile perf and load. But data-driven find logic is just so powerful. And I'm going to show you a couple quick examples of it. Uh, obviously, this being one of them. So, how does this begin? This begins by me, uh, you know, clicking on it was the United States span. So we'll go down and do the same thing. Okay. So that captured it as click United States span, right? Then I went in and edited the element. Since we're in the live UI, we can do that. Oops, it, it already uh, changed back to the wrong page. So let me go back here. My recorder still paused, so we'll just back up the page. Because when I clicked it, it changed pages. Let's validate and see that, yes, indeed, it is finding it. Now, the reason it's identifying it this way already is because I have a high priority already placed on text content. And it could not find an automation ID, a name, or an ID property. So it's continued down the list. Text content was next on my list. Intertext was next after that. Class was in there, too. Um, so it's got those up at the top of my list as other alternatives. But this works. When you have data on a test, not only does that data come available in the ellipses area of the bindings catalog, but it carries through here. So when data is on a test, you'll see that there's a drop down for the elements of that test as well. And that's where we're taking advantage of this. We've essentially captured the basic United States, and we're injecting country here, and we're saying, okay, this little message is saying, hey, you're not going to be able to edit this element against the live UI, because guess what? You're putting something in there that's going to be dynamic at, at runtime. So a uh, little, little fair warning there, I guess. Now, not only did we do it for the, the button that we click, we did it here for the verification or the welcome tag, too. So this particular test step uh, has and this is you know, not going to find it because we're not on the right page, plus it's being data-driven. 
but this one uh, uses the text content too. So find the tag name, find the heading that contains the text content of welcome or willkommen or bienvenue. And that's all we needed. Well, that's on top of that, I actually did sort of the data-driven find logic and verified the surface level as well. So I actually have this one step data-driven at two different kind of levels at the same time. All right. So that's the beauty of data driving your find logic. Oh, I do have to show you this uh, couple other options here. I guess I never really showed you the while loop, but uh, I'll show you one similar, and we'll talk a little bit about grids while we're at it here. So let's get into the grid. And we'll do uh, is it Kindle pricing update. Yeah, I believe that's the one. We'll play with this one. So this one has a very little test here. Navigate to an inline editing grid. This is another common question I get, and I have a couple of tutorials that cover this as well. Um, but basically, we're going to an inline editing grid. The common question is, we have a grid that's dynamic. How do we do identification logic in a reliable way in a dynamic grid? And, you know, it's something that's quite impossible, especially when you have an inline editing grid where every row has the same edit button. How do I identify one edit button versus the next? Okay, so we're navigating. We're verifying that we got there. We're executing a subtest. And this time I'm using a subtest here because of a couple things. First of all, there is a bunch of steps in this. But second of all, this is a process that I want to loop. And this is something you might want to jot down. When you have a subtest that's data-driven, it will naturally loop. So if we go back to this master test, this kind of parent test, it navigates once, verifies that we're on the right spot, and then it's going to go through this same process over and over again because there's a data source on the subtest. And then after it's done with all its data, it's going to come out of that last iteration and do step four there. Now in the subtest, I have click edit link. I have update a price. Click the update link. Wait two seconds. Verify that it's updated. The rest of the stuff's just hanging on, stuff that I had uh, disabled at some point in time. Let's see what happens. I'm going to turn annotation on. Uh, you know what? We'll do a right-click run to here. At the end of this, we'll do this in IE, so we stay in, a, in the record mode as well. And I can show you a little bit of this find logic that's happening to help us in this process. So here's our inline editing grid. It's going to verify that we're on the right spot. And I'll go ahead and take this opportunity to go full screen so you can see that. Verifying that we're on the right spot. And then it should go through and edit multiple items. We're going to Northwoods Cranberry Sauce, $1.50. Update that. Uh, chai, I want to say, maybe is the next one. Chang, sorry about that. And that's $1.50. We'll update that price. So this is looping through. The only thing that's doing different is it's finding a different row. And you'll notice that it's not going in alphabetical order. It's not going in an index order, it's actually kind of jumping around. And that's on purpose. So this will wrap up here. I'm not sure how many iterations I've got. Maybe four. Oh, this is the last step. This is step four out of four. So, <clears throat> should wrap up for us. Attach the recorder. While that's attaching, we'll jump back over to, uh, to Test Studio and see some result data and some log file data. Here's our log file. And it went through iteration one, food equals cranberry. Iteration two, food equal chang. Iteration three, food equal aniseed. Food equal Cajun for four. And then it jumped out and it ran that final verification. Pretty cool. So that was coming from inside of the loop, uh, and there's, there's no actual loop step in this, right? It's just the nature of having a test as step with its own data source. The data source in this case is coming from local data, 
this could very well be coming from other places too, a spreadsheet or even from extracted data. And uh, basically this is being fed into, you know, there is a verification that I have turned off on the surface here, but there's really nothing tangible uh, from a surface level. It's actually right here. Click this edit link. We'll open this, edit in the live. And here we have, it's going to say we can't find it because it's data, uh, data driven. That's expected. But it is showing me uh, the, va the variable, the values, and things like that. So it is actually finding it. And actually, let's see what we see on the UI. It's actually highlighting the Chang edit button right now. So it is actually finding it, even though it's kind of barking at us and saying, hey, this is uh, data driven. But this is the key to it. A chained fine expression, which you can quickly make. You, you record the, the clicking of the edit button, and then from the clicking of the edit button, you go over to the DOM tab, you click validate, you work your way through the uh, layers to the ultimate row level of the, uh, of the row. And you can add that in. Uh, when you add the row in, when you, when you do that replace element option to add in the row, and a row is that TR tag name and I combined it with the inner text. Well, the inner text of a row is all of the data of the row. And over here on the, uh, oops, we're not seeing it on the suggestions, but uh, maybe if I was to clear this really quickly, I'll show you an example. Uh, so you can see that this is highlighting the edit button for Chang, and this is what it might look like when you first capture it. I'm going to click over to DOM, I'm going to click validate. That takes me to this spot here. There's the edit button. This is a cell, the TD role. If I look back at the UI, it's highlighting the whole cell. If I go up to the next one, we should see highlighting the next cell. If I go up to this TR, the row, I should see it highlighting the whole row. Boom. It's at this row level that I want to right click, replace element. This is a temporary HTML path. This is not your final answer. After you right-click and replace element, go back to suggestions. And here you see all this other data it found, including inner text, role, tag name. These are all very helpful. And even a Kendo k class that you can use to help you too, since that's a Kendo grid. But a bunch of stuff that's better than this HTML path. So I'm going to drop the HTML path. And then I got this inner text with Chang and the dollar fifty and the false and the edit and the delete. This some of this stuff is subject to change. It will change. So I'm going to take off all that stuff that I don't need, modify this inner text to contains operator. Now I'm looking for in the grid the row that contains the inner text of Chang. And when I click validate here, we should see it still highlights that row. And if we want to uh, let me just fix the browser here a little bit. We'll do that again just to show you that, yes, indeed, it's highlighting the correct row. Now, this is a dynamic grid, right? It can be sorted. It can be filtered. New records can be added. Since we're not using indexes here, instead we're using content, we can go find that particular row no matter where it goes. All right, we don't just have to willy-nilly take the first row or, or grab an edit button from somewhere. We can target something specific, and we can go, go until we find it. Uh, ultimately, we want the edit button. So I'll add another child to this, which is going to ultimately be the cell of the row. And I'll just type this one in. Text content is exactly edit. Validate. I get some stuff back over on the UI. I'm highlighting the edit button. Everything's great. I can uh, clean this up, maybe add a role to strengthen it, maybe add something else. But ultimately now I have a way to go find the uh, Chang rows edit button. Uh, I could put this in a while loop as I did on the previous example and have it loop through multiple pages until it finds it. Uh, but I've got a great way to, to locate that. Now that I've got this, the other thing is once you do this, you don't, you don't have to do this for every single option. You set up this sort of structure and then you add data to it. So once I change this out to food, I have it a data-driven 
find expression that will naturally create iterations and naturally make this whole process loop within that sub uh, within that subtest essentially. So that's the uh, that's the beautiful thing, the the cool things you can do, and, and the way that that identification logic works with uh, with grids there. Okay, so the and I'm going to get you a link here. You'll find our YouTube page. Uh, if you don't follow it, please do. We've got more videos that are going to be coming out. This was a recent tutorial video that we've added. I'll drop this link in the chat for you. This is a great one in addition to the settings uh, that goes through random word extract and contact creation. And what that is, just, just to give you a quick high level, um, let's see, we'll get out of this filter here. And I'm just going to pull up a master test here. Okay. So this is another master test with kind of subtest situation. Uh, this really illustrates a lot because it uses a setup routine. So the first test of this, uh, the first test to step uses a, a test that goes and gets random words. So this is actually also in our documentation. Not only do you have a video of this now, but in our actual uh, online docs, if you look up extract, you'll see basically this same example where it goes through random word generator and so on and so forth. So drop that link for you too. Extract gets you the access to variables at runtime. So if I open up this random word extract, it navigates to random word generator, it clicks generate, it extracts the random word, calling it random word one. So this is yet another way to get data. We have data from spreadsheets or databases. We have data from inside of the test with local data. Now here we have data that we can pick up along the way, which is really powerful. Um, so extract goes and gets whatever kind of word is there. It, it, one thing that I do like to point out on this, and I think this is covered in the video, you want to make sure that your target where you're pulling the data from is not trying to identify the element with that data value. Okay, That would be basically like saying go extract um, in Charles from random word one when that's the current value of it, and the next time we generate a random word, it turns into uh, Bob, then in that that would fail. So this is using logic that does not include the value, since the value is, is what we want to get, and the value is uh, designed to change. So that extracts those values. Um, extract, by the way, we saw it in the element highlighter. During the record mode, you highlight an element, and you can go into quick steps, and go down to extract and you'll get to to that point. Uh, you can always change this name, do whatever you'd like. Okay. Now I have that extraction and then I go into a login test, same login we were playing with earlier, and then I have an exec, uh, execute test create contact, and here we have data driven first name and last name. Except there's a couple differences here. Uh, when we look at the values here, when we look at the drop-down, or, or let's say we were going to enter uh, up data drive this enter text one two three four, and we go to the drop-down, there's nothing here in the drop-down, right? These random words are not listed on this particular test. What's happening with this is we have what we call passing a variable, uh, and it's using extraction as well. And there's one other document that I have for you. There it is. And this also, I think, refers to maybe the same type of random word thing as well. It's just a really more of the continuation of the other link I submitted. But basically, uh, the create contact is drawing on the, the random words that were picked up in the first subtest. The reason that's possible is because they're under the same master test. So when you connect them together by having them kind of report back to the same parent test, or in some way they're connected with test to step, then they get to share that data. Now, inside of the random word extract test itself, where these variables are captured, 
me just add a, a verification real quick. Just something random here. So if I have a, a test step here at the bottom of this test and I want a data drive it, I go into the bindings property for that test step, guess what? Random word one and random word two live in this test. Now they're runtime variables. So, so this isn't going to iterate. It's going to just be a one and done. It, every time I run it though, it's going to be unique. It'll go get that, that random data for me. Okay. So that's where they live and you can use them directly in the same test just like we did before. When you want to pass a variable though from one sub -test, test to the next, you do of course need to have them under the same kind of parent level test, but then when you want a data drive the test step, you go to the test step, you go to bindings, and you have to, at the bottom here, actually type in the variable. I always just go copy and paste it so I don't mess anything up. But when they are set that way and connected to each other, it works like a champ. Okay. Um, all right, so that is extraction and passing a variable. Coding and code samples. Ooh, we're right at the three o'clock section too. Test list results. Okay, cool. We'll, we'll, we'll get into a little bit of that. So for this, I'm going to go back to my new project over here which also takes advantage of this extraction. And, and now I should mention too, this extraction thing that I'm talking about is a setup routine. It's one option. A lot of people look at that and they say, well, we, we have scripts that do our setup routine. If we need a random number or a random word, we have a script that does that and it, and it does, you know, whatever. And that's fine. You know, that, that is very typical. You can do that with Test Studio. You can add helper class files to the project. Uh, add new code file or add existing code file. Uh, you know, and those can be called into different coded steps throughout your process. So absolutely, you can do that through code. And we've probably got some examples of that already in our uh, code samples library too. But I'm giving you an alternative that's kind of the codeless variety because a lot of our customers are, are looking for those solutions. In fact, it was the... Uh, an airline customer that, that drove me to create this date extraction test and uh, here I am using it in one of my own projects um, but they basically called up and said I had a script that used to calculate future dates for me that I would use in my uh, airline scheduling test and, and that script broke and the person that made it is gone and I can't fix it and I need help. Can you fix it for me? And I said, well, I'll tell you what, rather than fixing your broken script, why don't we create a test that you can maintain yourself, a codeless one? Now, some people say, well, hey, this is relying on some third-party website to go da uh, calculate some dates. Well, that's just to me the same as relying on some third-party developer to maintain your script for you. <laughs> it's one or the other, but you can always find uh, alternatives to this. You know, I have a couple different versions of these that use different date calculators. It uh, just depends on, on what you want. So, so that's a setup routine, a codeless setup routine that could also be done through code. Now, in this particular test, I have the master call all these different subtests. First, it starts by getting today's date. And that's used actually in the last subtest. So it's extracted here and it's passed in here. Inside of the execute go to webinar and add session and extract uh, ID, this one also has an extraction. And here's a, where we start to see the code being used. And this is my approach and what I encourage you to do where you'll get the most out of Test Studio is don't code unless you need code. Uh, if you do code, do what I'm doing here. Make a copy of your test. So you can see I had the original codeless version of this test. There's no code behind file. This little icon here is the code behind file. That's not necessary. It doesn't need to exist if you have a codeless test. Now, if you need to code something, you can right click and edit and code and choose either C Sharp or VB.net. You can do that all right here in Test Studio. But I'm not going to do it to this test. I'm going to use this one as my sort of fallback. Right? Uh, and, and if I mess up my coded one here, I can go back. And, uh, and use my codeless one and recopy it. So I just create copy and paste of these. So my suggestion, if you're going to get into code, uh, you know, copy and paste it, just depending on your comfort level. 
and that way you can always kind of revert back to your previous version. Okay, so why did I use code here? The reason I used code in this particular test was because it was going in and creating a, a new session in GoToWebinar. And at the point that we extract the webinar ID for the new webinar that's just been created, um, I needed to modify it. So the extraction is a codeless extraction, but it's this step here that modifies this variable. And it really doesn't need to modify it for this test, it's modifying it for the test that's going to use it later. Here's the actual code for that, which is to uh, essentially take the extracted variable, which is what I've dubbed webinar ID one week, and what I've done is use a mydata.replace, which takes two arguments, took me a little while to figure that out, uh, but the IntelliSense is really helpful with that too, it's built in, you don't have to have you know, Visual Studio or anything like that, but if I start typing in here, uh, or, or in the case of the mydata here, just typing in mydata, and I get to the dot, and I started looking through and kind of reading the documentation, and I saw some uh, other examples online, and I rolled down and I found replace. And I read the uh, information there, and it's really useful, helpful information. Tried a couple different options in there, and, and I got it. So basically I'm saying when you extract the webinar ID, remove the dashes from it and replace it with nothing. Because where I need to plug this in, needed a different format of the same value, okay? It wouldn't accept dashes. It would only accept numbers. Uh, so that's what we uh, what we did there. And let me clean up after myself. As you can see, my syntax error is down below. It's kind of going crazy. And then we can do a compile there, make sure I didn't break anything. Build succeeded. Great. So, uh, so there's our code behind files. So we can also put these side by side maybe pin back some of these extra steps as well, and basically work on our virtually codeless test over here, and just code what you need to code, okay? So there was one instance where I needed to uh, get an extracted variable in code and then convert that, or set that variable with a different kind of variation. That comes from our documentation. You'll, you'll see that in our documentation, there's a section under advanced topics, for code samples. And under general, um, I believe it's not too far down here, it should be get set variables in code. Oh, there's a generate random text there, so here's a code version of that. Uh, so you always have that option, generate random number as well. VB or C sharp options in there. Extracted variables in code. So here's my get and set uh, and how I utilize that, and then I read through some documentation on the on the other options to kind of modify that. Uh, so that was one. So I modify that, and 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 that now webinar ID one week is extracted and modified, and kind of sits ready for me. And I had another extraction here, and I didn't really do anything with yet, um, but it's in there. So going back to the master test, then I had the uh, log out, the log in to the next application. And here I ran into an issue where I needed to code again. Um, we had hover over, we have uh, search options in there. Uh, we got down to the spot and here I have entering text into uh, a webinar ID essentially which lives inside of a frame. And this is actually where I'm still trying to correct the issues and, and resolve the issues regarding some frames. Uh, but I'll tell you what I did. I, I got to the point where I was failing at this. I wrapped up the, uh, zipped up the failure details and submitted my own support ticket from the help tab under submit ticket. And uh, I contacted my support guys. So hoping they helped me out. But uh, but no, they're a great help. And basically uh, that's what I encourage you to do as well. But I have a frames uh, logic going on here that I needed to code for. You'll find when it comes to frames, there are some different articles. In my case, it's an iframe uh, for this particular application. So I'm using the add tag to iframe option. Uh, there's a couple of different options in here. And uh, you know, it's another code sample. Uh, we also ran into another spot. Let's see. Going back to my master here. 
with the updating the webinars page. And in this case, it was updating a date, it looks like. And within that date, I had to also include some static text. Uh, so the codeless version of that test step was just going to put in the date, but I actually needed the date in the time. And since I'm data driving this with the variable that's extracted in the first subtest, I needed to plug in the date and then add the time. And since the time is static, it didn't, it didn't matter. I was just able to, excuse me, to do just that. Okay. So, so those are some different code samples in our documentation. There's tons of these. Um, you know, generally speak, I mentioned this one earlier too, accessing SQL. Sometimes it'll say, hey, there's a codeless way to do this. Uh, if you're looking to data drive a test, you can go here. Um, you know, we really just try to minimize it and reduce it as much as possible, but it's here. You know, if you want to read from SQL, you want to write it in SQL. If you want to script every, for everything you can, absolutely. Uh, so there's lots and lots of, of examples and things for you to, uh, to work from on there. 